Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, welcome to our discussion around how CTV advertising deals are currently being transacted and how publishers can increase their advertising revenues. Um, I'll let everyone briefly introduce themselves and uh, you can tell a little about yourself and the companies so to the listeners. Uh, I'll let Jason start. Hey, I'm Jason DeMarco. Uh, oversee our non-traditional revenue for digital um, and anything non-linear at A&E Networks. Uh, so that includes our programmatic partnerships, um, marketplace opportunities, resellers, um, which would incorporate kind of your MVPDs and station groups, um, and then any ad networks and platforms. Um, we've created quite a set of diverse revenue streams in doing this um, and appreciate you know being part of the conversation and, and uh, answering some of these questions. I'll go next. Hi, Sarah. Um, Seho Lee, uh, VP of Sales at Unruly. Um, Unruly operates a programmatic video marketplace powered by our supply side platform technology, and I oversee the demand facilitation with our U.S. sales team. Uh, hey, guys. I'm Henry. I'm head of ad products and revenue for Crunchyroll. Uh, Crunchyroll is like the destination and the home of anime. Um, so essentially, we have two business models. One is SVOD subscription video on demand and AVOD. So you can either pay for it and get it without ads or not pay for it and get it with ads. And I'm responsible for the monetization of all the ads on platform, which is predominantly obviously through programmatic partnerships and, uh, and relationships. And hello everybody, I'm Ben Antier. I'm the CEO of Publica. Um, for those who don't know, but I think most of the people on this uh, webinar have, have heard of Publica now. Um, so we're, we're a connected TV ad server. So we work with publishers, to help maximize yield and deliver the highest quality of um, user experience on connected TV devices. Great, thanks for all for joining. Um, Sarah, I work as manager of publisher development at Publica and I'll be asking all the fun questions today. So we'll, we'll get it started. Um, so a kind of a question to Jason, Henry and Seho, what, why are advertisers so excited about the CTV opportunity that's happening at the moment? It's new, it's exciting, it's the new It's the new sort of thing. And I think what we're seeing is obviously is the decline in linear TV and sort of cord cutting, cord nevers, or the, all the sort, of the sort of terminologies there. Essentially what is happening is eyeballs are shifting from t traditional TVs um, to connected devices. And that's obviously sort of very interesting from an advertiser perspective, because not only is you enable the broad reach of, you know, obviously sort of you know, being able to sort of, you know, park massive budgets towards massive eyeballs, but also as well with the technology and the targeting, all of a sudden you can get very sophisticated and innovative with the ads and the ad products. Awesome. And as this revenue is shifting, Seho, where do you see these CTV budgets coming from? Traditional, digital? I think most of the CTV is still packaged in with linear, uh, especially during the upfronts. But we are seeing a rapid shift. We're seeing it firsthand across our marketplace uh, that uh, CTV budgets are moving digital and they're also being transacted programmatically. You know, I think to to both uh, Henry and Sayo's points, the kind of the, the growth trajectory throughout 2020 um, was in large part because people were just looking for more content. They were spending more time at home um, and it helped accelerate the CTV adoption and the evolution of viewership, which as a result, then obviously marketing dollars need to follow the eyeballs. Um, you know, some of the some of the analyst forecasting was that the numbers we hit in mid 2020 from a viewership perspective on CTV were not expected to be reached until 2022. So that that kind of growth really helped. And, and obviously the marketing dollars are getting more and more intelligent. Um, and CTV offers you all of the digital capabilities around addressability, uh, attribution reporting, um, and, and really making it a, a more effective or efficient spend um, while still kind of having that brand affinity and that engagement with a consumer or a viewer that is a lean back, fully engaged environment. It's the large screen TV in the living room. It is the appointment based viewing. Um, so it, it's really taking all the value propositions and making the advertising dollar that much more effective. And there, there's reporting that shows that. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention though, coming from a TV company, um, that TV is still the biggest medium. Um, it's a matter of how do we bridge this gap and bring together all of the advanced capabilities of connected TV while still leveraging TV's reach and frequency and the ability to kind of get that broad message out there. So I think it's uh, partially, um, and then to sales point, it, it's partially TV budgets moving into CTV. We're seeing a lot of digital centric budgets that are actually 
moving towards CTV and away from some of the desktop. Um, I think we'll quickly get to a point where you have living room spend and you have digital spend. And digital will probably be the phone, the tablet, the computer, the web. Um, and CTV, VOD, AVOD, Fast Channels, and every other acronym that we've created over the last three years will be um, largely part of a, a TV spend. Um, that's, I, I think directionally it's all great, especially for the people on this call. So instead of linear versus digital, it's gonna be living room versus digital. I think so. And I think that might be to the benefit of marketers, to consumers. Um, and like I said, to the people on this call, you're, you're, if we approach it from an environment perspective and what the objective is, uh, whether it be engagement, uh, brand affinity, brand awareness, and, and how the message can be deployed, right? Um, I think that will help the overall marketplace kind of um, evolution and growth. Um, taking a six second ad, jamming it into CV, CTV, has not the same impact and effect as a six second ad on a mobile device or a phone that's being used for snackable content. So I think using the CTV environment for all of the best benefits that it has, um, long form full episode viewing, uh, kind of appointment based time shifted viewing and engagement, and then leveraging uh, kind of the TV, what we've learned from TV over 75 years, which is how to get the message across, how to tell a story in 30 seconds, um, and, and look, I'll, I'll be candid about it. That also helps TV companies and digital CTV companies uh, because the economics around it slide in our favor. Um, it, when you're able to charge for 30 second ads, as opposed to trying to find yield and yield optimization, yield management around six second ads, it doesn't fill out the commercial break. Oh, to add on to that, look, we're very early in the sort of the trend of the cycle. As linear is going down, obviously CTV is going up to put some numbers around it. You know, in like 2020, the total addressable sort of advertising market for linear TV was $61 billion, but CTV was only $8 billion. So if you just look that $61 billion is going to trickle down into that sort of, you know, $6 billion bucket and there's going to be some normalization. But then also as well, you've got a, a cultural element of it as well. So a media buyer, an agency, obviously on the sort of, you know, who's controlling these large budgets, who's had a relationship with Procter & Gamble for 30 years and obviously manages their budgets. And then you come along and say, hey, there's this new sexy thing called CTV. There's going to be a lot of sort of initial resistance to change in a way, right? So again, once the sort of the generational and time sort of factor comes out, I think you're going to continue to see that 8 billion number just continually sort of gradually grow year over year. And that $61 billion will decline as well. It's not going to zero, but it will continue to decline and trickle over into, into that CTV budget. Yeah. And I, th I think the question is, how long is it going to take for that to happen, right? And it's... It's interesting because most of the forecasts today show an adoption that's actually the, the, uh, the growth is going to decelerate over the next few years. And, and most, I think, um, you know, analysts say it's going to take 10 years to transition those budgets. I don't know. What, what do you guys think on this panel? I mean, I'm obviously pretty biased towards a, a faster transition, but, you know, I, I hear the point, right? It's going to take some time. The fine transition, though, is, again, is it that linear TV budgets go to zero? That's never going to happen. It's not going to go to zero. There will always be a need for it, just as there are still radio budgets around, right? So that's right. not going to happen. But, but what is transition? I think, you know, we've seen the validation and the acceleration. And I think we're just sort of, you know, to use that sort of, you know, Silicon Valley term, escape velocity is ensuing, right? And, and you know, it will continue to grow. And as to say, as more eyeballs continue to shift, and those eyeballs suddenly won't be able to target against on the linear linear, there's, there's, that, there's that really good chart that Matthew Ball, who's it's like a Twitter personality has, which he shows the decline of all the different demographics of consumption habits. And as I say, in two, three, four, five years time, there just won't be enough capacity for advertisers and eyeballs to go and target. So they'll be forced to have to go into the CTV space. So it, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, as I say, it'll happen. All good things take time. Henry, do you, do you guys have a strategy at Crunchyroll on how you're, like we're in an in-between time. So, you know, what is your strategy to kind of capture this money and, you know, support advertisers as they want to increase money into AVOD? I, I think, you know, in terms of our strategy, obviously, is Crunchyroll is, 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 you know, there are big and broad streaming services that appeal to everyone and everything, which have, you know, different genres and age demographics, whereas a Crunchyroll is specifically about anime. So we know who our audience is. So we just go and target four core verticals within that, which is like games, entertainment, CPG, and QSR. Right, those are the sort of four verticals. It doesn't really make sense to go, you know, looking for life insurance campaigns because, you know, 18 year olds are not looking for life insurance right now. So very much sort of set ourselves up. And with those sort of types of buyers, you know, they're more familiar with it. You know, whereas if you're sort of going after those linear budgets, I, I think it takes a lot more hand holding. 
Yeah, Jason, you have a different kind of audience, so how do you approach this? Yeah, and I think just going back to Ben's question really quick about um, kind of when is that that point of inflection where CTV either outgrows linear um, or, or we get to kind of a 50-50, I think part of it in the spend or the, the budget allocation for marketers is change management. There's still a lot of legacy leadership, whether it's at marketers, agencies, or even you know the, the content companies, um, which is been slow or slower to adopt some of these. Uh, there's also been a disconnect in the marketplace itself and in the negotiations where you know, I spoke earlier about CTV and linear being packaged, they're not packaged together, but being looked at as a, a similar same viewing experience and how do we create the marketplace around that. We can't do that though with the same economic principles of a CPM or a GRP rate um, because to the imbalance that Henry keeps talking about, that doesn't allow for the economics or the yield management to be accurate. So I think part of it's still change management. Part of it is, um, and I know we've been saying this for six, seven years, part of it's education and knowledge. Um, understanding what it is that you're paying for as a marketer when you buy CTV and what the value is, what the benefits are, um, and how to get the planners uh, past that, that initial shock phrase of why is, this, why is the CPM or the cost per GRP so much higher on CTV because they're not looking at it as a normalized effective CPM. They're looking at it just as a, a base rate. So I think part of it is just change management. Uh, part of it is still that scale and that growth in CTV has been so sudden and so quick um, that we can't expect. It's always been the user or the viewer changes the behavior first, right? They went from web to app or mobile, uh, then the programmers and publishers, then the technology, and then the marketers came a couple of years later. So I think we're seeing something similar. Um, I hope it's not 10 years, because I think by that point, the viewership will be so far ahead. Um, we'll be playing catch up in a, in a lot of different areas. Sarah, the question about um, marketers and advertisers and, and how we're approaching this. Um, a lot of the advertisers tend to be in our programmatic space and in our CTV environments tend to be similar to our TV advertisers. Uh, some of them, because our linear networks are a little bit older skewing from, a, from an age perspective, um, we do see a kind of incremental base of advertisers coming into CTV because they're looking for that younger audience. Uh, some of our owned and operated apps are actually 10 years younger in the CTV environments versus the, the TV uh, experience, the linear experience. Um, but we'll, what we've been focusing on is more of that <clears throat> incremental viewership, those eyeballs that you're not getting on linear because again, it goes back to the viewing experience. If that's a time shifted appointment based viewing and I'm watching the CTV, the, the program, Vikings on the history app when I want to watch it rather than when it premiered, most likely I didn't watch it on the linear uh, live feed. So it's about incremental reach. It's about identifying where our brands have connectivity to it. And in large part, we've used our programmatic and our, our non-traditional selling capabilities and strategy to create flexibility. It's where we benefited throughout 2020 as many TV buyers took options and needed to you know, back out of spending commitments from the upfronts because they did not know what was happening economically and what was gonna be available to them from marketing and budget perspective. Our flexible kind of approach in CTV and in digital allowed us to take a lot of those dollars with, uh, while mitigating the risk on the front end for the advertisers. So the short answer is a lot of the same advertisers. Um, however, a good deal of them are the younger skewing and, and, and looking for the audiences that are not watching live linear, whether it be cord cutters, cord nevers, or just consuming content differently. Yeah, I also think a key factor is going to be on around how live sports viewership plays out. Um, you know, a lot of the different league, major sports leagues contracts end up in the next few years. And will it be some of the digital first players that take the ownership or is it going to be the big broadcast company? So that's going to have a huge impact on how much of those dollars go shifted to streaming versus linear. Didn't I see something that like Amazon acquired rights for sort of the NFL? Is that right? So I saw, I saw some news on that. There, yeah. I, I think like a portion of the games throughout the season. And the digital, right, right? There's, there's, the NFL is doing a very good job of fragmenting up the rights and maximizing the dollars in each experience. So I think a lot of it is the digital rights and the streaming rights, but then there, the NFL is still asking for a hundred percent increase on the broadcast rights uh, for the new, the new terms. So I agree with you, Shadow. The, the sports is in an interesting place um, because we watched the news become more of a mobile um, consumption, right? Uh, where, where news was helping prop up linear TV for a while because it was news and sports. That's all people were watching live. Now news seems to continue to, to skew to a mobile environment, a mobile experience, less on TV. Um, sports is going to be interesting. Uh, are, are, 
are the demographics of sports loyalists, sports viewers, and, and whatnot, is that, that the age hasn't gotten younger as the, uh, in the viewing experience as, as we've progressed over the last few years. And I don't know if that's going to change. Um, I used to think that when I was 29, I wouldn't have cable. And when I was 35, I would go get cable because now I'm an adult, right? Like there's kind of that, that uh, analogy or, or, or anecdote used to be applied. I don't know because now we're starting to see seven, eight years into some of the streaming and CTV environments. The the subscription basis for MVPDs because of live sports and because of news and live viewing isn't actually changing that much. And we're not getting the adoption by the younger audience. So not to go off on a total tangent, but um, I think there's there's going to be a lot of the future that's going to be dictated and architect by what happens with the sports rights, especially if the networks overpay for sports rights and then they need to get higher rates, household rates from the MVPDs which is gonna be passed to the consumer and will you alienate more and more consumers by increased cable bills um, and, and actually continue this trajectory of, of adoption of cord cutter, cord never streaming, so on and so forth. And it's been interesting to see what some of the services offering live sports in CTV, you know, how they're addressing that. I mean, YouTube TV is now, I think at $70 per month, you know, which is, which is, a lot higher when it started. I think it was at 35. I was one of the you know first uh, subscribers four or five years ago, and that's I think mostly due to sports rights, right? That now okay, you want the NBA? Well, guess what? You have to you have to double your price from a for, from an SVOD perspective. So there's a real challenge there. But I think all of the major sports leagues are addressing that in one way or another. I mean, we saw the NFL, you know, doing their kids. Um, version this year and, and or, or teenager I, I don't know how the, how they framed it but it, it's interesting because they all see it as a major you know challenge but also milestone that they need to get to as younger audiences and I think CTV is an amazing way to do that I mean there there's so many ways that you're going to be able to watch content at different price points for different audiences so I think it's it's inevitable that it's going in that direction and and really it's also back to, to the advertising piece it's about you know it's our jobs to make sure that from an advertising perspective, we're able to to deliver the value that these companies need to acquire those rights. And it's not just based on subscription fees that are good. You know, they can't keep skyrocketing. It, it's interesting because it turns out to be, I think, all about advertising again and how effective we can be at it. Right. Google also just reported one of their greatest quarters ever or their best quarter ever, uh, to your point, Ben, because of right. the transition of eyeballs into into the streaming environment and they're one of the only ones that has a diverse kind of panel of uh of sports rights i want to shift back a little bit into kind of talking about budgets and spend and and kind of get everyone's thoughts on how how we're going to be using first and third party data moving forward to kind of maximize the amount of ad spend that you can get because you know as, as uh, viewership and prices increase obviously avod's a way to offset that price and you're going to get higher prices with more data so uh, ben, what what kind of technology do we have coming to to kind of help, you know, get those budgets? So that's that's a, a really interesting question and one that we you know we're we're constantly thinking about at public. I think to to Jason's point initially, I think that the most important usage of data, at least in the short term, is going to be incremental reach. So it's going to be about giving advertisers the ability to target audiences that they cannot target in traditional TV or, you know, in anywhere else really. So it's it's that's what the the from a technical standpoint that's what we focused on is making sure that we have the ability to do basically negative targeting. If I know that I've reached this user elsewhere, I don't want to reach them again at a premium on CTV. And that's, you know, to to. To the point of Jason, you were making about education too. It's to me, I see it as it's also about building the technology to to make it very seamless from the advertisers. Right? Hey, I'm looking for you know this audience. If I can reach it in a traditional way, great. I know I'm comfortable with that. Now, how can I get incremental eyeballs in CTV? And frankly, the technology is there today, right? It's all about having a delivery system that's able to feed back into an audience management system to let it know, hey. These are the users you've reached um, at this price. This is how many ads you've delivered to them. And, and really those integrations are now built and, and I, I think work really well. And, and that's the part that 
is going to accelerate this transition, which is why I'm a big believer in, in accelerated, um, you know, transitions and trends rather than deceleration in the next few years. Henry, how, how important for credit has first party data been when it comes to generating deal demand? Like are buyers advanced uh, enough in their TTV deal requests to be asking for this or kind of what do you see now and in the future? It's a first party data is obviously is like, you know, there's this new saying data is the new oil, right? Everyone wants data to be able to target against it. And, you know, um, you know, we're, we're not the most at the cutting edge in terms of first party data. So that's why we rely on a third party data and sort of, you know, sort of targeting capabilities and, and, and essentially, you know, there's, there's, there's a you know, number of you know, DMPs out there. Um, for example, I know we're, we're doing stuff at LiveRamp, for example. Um, and, and it just really sort of helps sort of add sort of add extra targeting and extra capabilities. You know, we have, there's an example where we had like a, you know, we had a, an advertiser who was a anti-smoking lobbying group and they wanted to target anyone who spent money at a vaping store. So for example, using third party instead of first party data, so we can, you know, glean sort of information from anyone who's bought a vape or spent money in a vaping store and can then positively target against that. So that just really helps versus just offering run of network. This is our audience. This is our demographic, though, who they are. So you get to slice and dice. So it has a couple of knock on impact effects. One is obviously it makes your ECPMs incredibly a lot more efficient or your ECPM goes way up. Number two is you're not burning impressions to sort of try and hit sort of a demo target goal or a sort of guarantee in any way. And then also further down the line for the end user, they're also not getting spammed and getting sort of, you know, frequency cap blowouts where they're just seeing the same ad back to back. So it's, it's a sort of win-win all around. It's a better experience. I think just the challenge with that is obviously the regulation that is, is around us and will probably only continue to come. Yeah. Seho, do you see that? Uh, do you see the spend happening on your side? Do you see these migrating budgets coming in and wanting specific data sets? Or is it, you know, kind of yeah, so a shift from IOs to programmatic? What does it look like for you right now? Oh, uh, well, I'll first answer the data part. So I think, you know, we're seeing an increasingly number amount of uh, requests for first party data for the online ecosystem, because that's where there's concerns around identity, especially with cross site tracking and so forth. So that's where we're seeing the high volume of requests come in. For connected TV, publishers first party data is definitely valuable. Um, but we're still seeing that the capabilities where they're able to scale third party audiences or first party data of their own advertiser set within the DSP is allowing them to execute their marketing campaigns. Second question, um, seeing IOs to programmatic. Uh, I think there's a stat that says about 55% of connected TV ad spend is executed programmatically. Um, but I would actually contest that. I think those numbers are probably skewed by the amount of uh, inventory that goes through the YouTube ecosystem. So um, I still think that CTV is primarily bought on a direct IO basis, um, packaged in with some of the upfront dollars. And um, overall, I'm thinking through kind of like initiatives like the IAB Tech Labs app, app ads.txt that helps brands increase their CTV ad buys. Like how do you think these initiatives are gonna increase these ad buys in the future for anybody? I think, I think what that accomplishes is uh, more trust and transparency into who the providers are. And with more trust will come more ad dollars because we've definitely seen our fair share of articles highlighting the fraud that exists within the connected TV ecosystem. And uh, I think just apps.txt will be one initiative that helps mitigate that. Yeah, yeah, and just to sort of follow on to that and to the previous point, I think Jason, we were talking about it was like, you know, these buyers, they're still a little bit sort of unsure about it. You know, how much fraud goes on in the linear TV market at the moment? None. Right. So there's still sort of very much there's still the wild west. So these kind of, you know, practices, protocols, standards, um, are good. It just gets to the point where, you know, we, as long as we don't end up having you know, a long list of like, you know, 30 things that we need to do to sort of, you know, execute a buy in a way. But yeah, it, it, it definitely sort of helps, you know, uh, make everyone feel a lot more comfortable. Sorry, I think, I think CTV will benefit from, from both the data. Um, and the unfortunate reality is that the fragmentation of data is probably only going to get worse, um, especially as we get to cookie environments and walled gardens, if you will, essentially get deeper. Uh, I know that everybody wants to get away from that term, but the reality is uh, when you see acquisitions of data capabilities and on-screen targeting capabilities and, and things like that in real time um, by certain companies that are in a walled garden environment, they're only entrenching themselves deeper. Um, and I think the fragmentation will kind of grow and that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
For advertisers and marketers, hopefully that means that you will have more data, more addressability and, and uh, reporting capabilities for attribution across a wider range of inventory. The, the, uh, the work will fall on you know, Ben, Sayo, myself and Henry on the back end. So publishers and inventory sources are going to have to stitch together either a combination of third and first party data um, platforms and, and you know, tech providers that sit in the middle are going to be responsible for having these multifaceted partnerships with the live ramps and um, Unified ID and, and all of these other solutions that are coming into fruition, as well as partnering with you know, the MVPDs or the content companies that have some form of a, a relationship with the consumer to create a better ecosystem when it comes to data. Um, for us as a programmer, first party data, we're, we're a general entertainment programmer. When you come into our digital environments, we're asking you to authenticate through your MVPD. We don't have access to any of that data that is owned by the, the MVPD, by the distribution company. So for us to grow our first party data, we've had to add a second layer of logging in. Um, not always the most widely adopted or popular thing to do is sign in multiple times just to watch a show. Um, but I think what's happening is we are getting better at collaborating across the ecosystem as the need to do this. Um, so as much as like cookies going away and some of these disrupting, whether it be um, privacy compliance from, from a regulatory perspective or just the Googles of the world and Apple and stuff, kind of putting these restrictions in areas, it may actually help the industry get to a better solution um, quicker. I think the, the IAB, the ads.txt, and the safety components of CTV um, may be getting overstated. Um, and I'm not, not in a, a negative way, but there are companies that rely on the ability to sniff out fraud, create a safer ecosystem, or at least create the comfortability and confidence of a safer ecosystem. Um, when they look at the amount of viewership that's happening in CTV, it's happening to the detriment of mobile and web, they've got to focus their their kind of uh, system solutions and, and um, attention into the CTV environment. And I fully understand that. I just hope we don't get to a point where we're starting to have to combat fraud as a perception rather than fraud as a reality. Um, that That's my only kind of public service announcement is, you know, CTV, yes, there's fraud there, but to what extent? Um, it is minimal compared to some of the other digital environments and to lump it into a digital fraud ecosystem um, is not to the benefit of anybody involved, except those that are, that are responsible for stepping out. I think it's necessary. I just hope that it's not overstated, uh, at least now or in the coming years. And I, I think w one thing that's important to note, especially pertaining to, you know, the topic of the discussion, which is, you know, CTV de deals is, I think today we're in an intermediary phase, right? Where we, the promise of programmatic, we all, I think we all firmly believe in it, right? Which is you can target individual users and pay the, the right price to deliver a message to them and be, and be billed for the delivery of that message, right? The reason why there's no fraud to your point, Henry, in traditional TV is because you're, you're not paying for, you know, every time someone's watching an ad, you're, you're paying for a campaign to run on a certain show and who God knows who's going to watch it. Right. The programmatic is just, you know, the next, you know, is, is light years away from that. We're saying, Hey, we're, we're going to let you, you're going to pay for people, right. It's people based uh, marketing, which I think is, is the beauty of it. But the problem is that today we're, we're, we're not, we haven't fulfilled that promise in the CTV space, because if you look at, you know, the open RTV um, bid requests that are being sent out, there's very little information. Buyers don't know what show they're buying. So that's why deals are kind of this, the way to solve for that is say, well, I don't really know what signals I'm getting. So I'm just going to set up a direct, you know, transaction with a publisher I trust and that way I'm sure that I'm going to reach their users and I'm only going to be billed when I do reach their users right it's not if the user changes channel and and, and goes to another one the impression tracker is not fired I'm not paying for anything right and that's that's really important so um, I think CTV deals right now are a way to address that but really we app has that text and everything is is meant to take the industry to the next level of, of trust in the ecosystem so that we can really fulfill the promise the promise of programmatic um and and that means you know being able to as a buyer know what you know what content i'm, I'm running my ad against um 
and also in what app and what device and is the entity firing the pixels a trusted entity right so there's a there's a lot of um of specs and actually public is pushing and, and, and being part of the IAB tech lab for for a lot of these to to make sure that we standardize these things um and ultimately just get back to a level of trust in the programmatic ecosystem that we're accustomed to in other environments where really, you know, buyers basically run JavaScript to check everything they need to check. And then they're able to, to comfortably say, okay, I've reached my target or I haven't, right? Um, and since there's no JavaScript, it's about just moving that in server to server uh, connections, which is not rocket science. You know, the banking industry's figured server to server transaction, you know, decades ago. It's just about ad tech getting to that level of, of trust um, where we can safely say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with this transaction that happened server side. So Jason already touched on this a little bit, but I do want to kind of circle back to, uh, you know, I know a lot of people have questions about the the future of the oncoming cookie list ecosystem. Jason already talked about it, but I'm kind of curious like, from Henry and Seho's perspective, you know, if you see this as a benefit and adverse effect, um, and if you had, you know, similar opinions to Jason's or different. <laughs> well, we'll find out shortly, won't we? Uh, you know, I think there's going to be two ecosystems. There's going to be the Google ecosystem and the open web ecosystem. Um, what that looks like, whether it's the UID or IDL or whatever alternative solution, there's still a lot of work to be done in that space, but I do think that we will ultimately find one uh, that works for everybody outside the, the Google landscape. Um, so, so, yeah, I do think that we will pro progress forward with one solution or another. Yeah, I, I, I don't like to speculate, so sort of make huge projections in a way. I, I, I'm going to plead the fifth and say, I don't really know the full impact and the full degree. Um, and I think we'll probably find out some devils in the details once, uh, once we get into that territory. And Sarah, by no means did I mean to sound naive. I, there's going to be an initial, um, oh. at least I presume, an, an initial impact that's going to be negative, right? We're going to see, there's going to be a struggle. Um, I think the, the future outlook, though, may benefit from it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not naive and don't think that when the cookie disappears, uh, and IDFA is turned off, um, at least from a opt out perspective that all of a sudden we're going to see growth in, in ad spend and things like that. There's definitely going to be a, a period or a time of, uh, kind of frustration and, and difficulty, but I don't think it's, um, I think the growth in overall volume and viewership in CTV, um, will help offset some of those potential, uh, declines. Um, yeah, won't be able to keep advertising down for for long. I know that. Um, so I've I've wanted to switch and kind of ask about you know a lot of controls that we have in the CTV space over ad breaks and you know that frequency like are buyers looking to target deals based on ad break frequency? Is this something that's on their radar? We have a lot of technology around it, so I'm curious how how buyers are seeing it. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny that you asked because. Um, we just had a call with a big financial advertiser right before this panel event, and they were asking, how do you know that I'm not serving my brand's ad one after another in the same pod? Uh, so those controls around user experience, because you never want to drive a user experience that's negative for the brand uh, and pay for it. So I think having more of those controls, more data, more granular opportunities to make sure that you're not providing a negative user experience will definitely help accelerate uh, trusting brands into diving more into connected TV. And, and ultimately to me, the, the important part of it is that, you know, the, whatever spec you're using it understands that concept, right? So today when you're, when you're running an, an RTV auction, you have to run a, a pod based auction and, and believe it or not, there's still a lot of uh, companies out there that don't don't do that right and the, the problem is if if the buyer doesn't know that this is you know there's four slots within the same pod it's going to bid this potentially the same ad on on all four slots so if you have the right deduplication mechanisms you can get rid of that but still that creates a ton of inefficiencies so it's all about making sure that the, the specs we're using are designed for this this space right which is becoming the dominant space in digital so um to, yeah to me the, the the whole question of ad breaks is around can you put the right signals in front of the buyers for them to make the right decisions in the first place and not have to you know block ads um a after the fact right uh and it's really not complicated technically it's just about um understanding you know the the, the technicality behind it 
and, and setting it up correctly to start with. And frankly, I think this is also a huge opportunity for deal making. Once you start to have the, the holistic view of the ad break, now you can start selling first in, in pod, you can start selling, you know, competitive exclusions. And, and really at, at, at Publica now we're even looking at cross pods, right? At a session, um, I want to be the first advertiser in a session. I want to be, you know, um, I, I want to buy out a session, an entire category. That's stuff that, you know, with with um, Henry, with Fe Seho, we, we've, we've worked on that from a technical perspective is having that session level insight to make sure that, um, yeah, if you want to be the only auto ad that a, a user is going to see, you can do that, but you're going to have to pay a premium for it. That's where, you know, deal making comes in. So I think it's, again, a big revenue opportunity when it's done right. That's great. Henry, is that is the ad pod kind of management something that you're going to be working on uh, or that you work on with Crunchyroll? Does that, does it look, what does it look like from a publisher perspective? Do you get these questions as well? I mean, we always want to, you know, we sort of like have a couple of sort of core objectives, but the main one obviously is, is to drive as much revenue as possible while, derive, while offering the best possible user experience. Of course, we need to drive revenue, but at the same time, we know that we can't piss off our users, right? So if there are opportunities, you know, as Ben was saying, for example, where you can have, you know, interact with this interactive ad and depreciate the pod. So therefore, you know, you get a higher premium as a publisher, we win. Obviously, the ad tech partner wins because they're selling their ad product and then the user wins as well at the end of the day. Then that, you know, that is a wonderful, wonderful sort of, you know, beautiful sort of yes, yes, yes. That's, you know, the, the art of the deal. Um, you can't do that on linear TV, right? You know, how many times can you do that? It's, it just doesn't work. So I think, you know, again, we're still, you know, 8 billion versus 61 billion just sort of shows how sort of nascent this space still is. And obviously how there's lots of kind of lots of sort of, again, combination of standardization, targeting, and then obviously the technology to enable that as well. Um, Jason, um, I'm just kind of curious, um, how are, how are you seeing things from your perspective today? Uh, you know, like what are some of the biggest challenges that are, that you're facing on, on your side of the business? The easy answer is, uh, what I alluded to earlier, uh, price parity, right? Being a TV company, um, the easy answer is always going to be price parity. Uh, majority of our conversations when we go into whether it be upfront or scatter market or just uh, pitches in general to holding company and agency teams um, because we are bucketed into that TV side of the house uh, as opposed to some of the digital pure plays and things like that um, and then we actually sometimes have to straddle the fence between both uh, since a, a lot of the ad spend is not happening as a cross-functional discipline right now in the ad uh, excuse me in the ad agency and marketing world still somewhat uh, verticalized. Um, <clears throat> so price parity tends to be one of those biggest, and I know it's a, it's a easy way out on the answer, uh, but that tends to be one of the biggest ones. Um, the other element is, is actually some of the stuff that we're talking about, which is knowledge and understanding about what the inventory is. Um, a large part of the growth in viewership has been because there's so many new outlets and so many new distribution plans or paths. So you have everything from our owned and operated TV everywhere apps that have been in play on CTV since late 2013. But now you also have fast channels, uh, right? Which is the free ad supported streaming, which you'll get on like a Samsung TV or a Vizio TV, uh, as well as the likes of uh, IMDb TV and Roku channel, right? Those are somewhat similar. Uh, you have Avod, so your Tubi's uh, and Pluto's of the world. You have um, the TV everywhere apps. So the Sling apps, the Hulu apps, the Comcast apps, everything is, is available to you in so many different ways um, that a lot of times it's just education still where, you know, what am I buying? I only want to buy the history app. Well, hold on. The same content is available. The same viewership experience is available in all of these other um, kind of platforms and, and viewing mediums. And if we're looking at like Ben had kind of validated earlier, if we're looking at incremental spend as an opportunity for CTV for both publishers, programmers, tech, and ultimately the marketers and the advertisers, then kind of blocking out some of these distribution points is working against you, right? It's, it's, not, um, it's not running two parallel paths. So price point is still a difficult one. Um, the worst meetings are when you walk in and they say, tell us, you know, this is our, our new media meeting. And, and you say new media, this is not, you know, you know immediately that you're going down a, a path of, uh, some difficult negotiations when it's, it's looked at as a test budget still. Um, and then the secondary one, I think is just the education and the knowledge. And really that's not 
the fault of anybody that's involved in kind of this multi-pronged wheel. It's just because the the expansion of content and the the ability to access it in so many different ways, access it in so many different ways, has been uh, shown unprecedented growth. Um, so I think those are the those are probably the two right now uh, from a sales perspective, from a product and kind of operationally, um, obviously stitching all these things together and overcoming different um, hurdles or points of friction in these partnerships um, also tends to be some of the more difficult areas. And so you know, from your perspective, if we keep talking about education, you know, kind of what we, we were hoping for the future, if you could, if you could provide some level of education that you wanted all the buyers to know, or uh, like what would be your wish be or something that you want everyone to understand better than they do today? You know, it, it's, if I could provide the answer, then I'd be in a much better position. I think fragmentation in the connected TV marketplace is extremely complex. We internally at Unruly try to understand it, and a lot of it's due to the amount of different access points for the same type of inventory across different distribution channels makes it extremely difficult from a buyer and both a seller standpoint. Uh, so I'd like to, you know, I think it'll be simplified and more unified as, you know, the days come ahead. Uh, but it's going to be commercially challenged. It's going to be product and technology challenged as well. Ben, from your side, uh, what technology, like what technology do we have today that's kind of solving for some of this, you know, fragmentation of you know, uh, all this content being in different places? How do you see technology now helping that and what we can do in the future? So it's, I, to, to Jason and Seho's point, I, I definitely understand the challenge, right? It's, it's, I mean, you have your content living in so many different environments where there's different rules, you know, even, even if you have your own, for example, SSAI solution, some of these fast channels have built their own. So you, you can't use yours. I mean, there's, there's many things that happen, right. That means that, that mean that your, your inventory is fragmented. I think the, the most important is first, we have to realize that we're in a, in a, in an increasingly sell side marketplace where the sellers are, um, you know, we talked about audiences, we talked about ad potting. I mean, now the publisher is responsible for all of this, right? Is packaging these, these audiences and these um, segments to, to then monetize either through deals or through, through direct IOs or whatever it may be. Um, and in that, in that context, it means that I think a publisher has to have a very, very good understanding of what inventory is being put out in the programmatic marketplace what that looks like. So well, for example, at Publica, we give a lot of insights into um, the, the live logs or, or, you know, being able to see, you know, you click a button and you see what bid requests as it originates from Hulu or from wherever your environment is. So you could see what are programmatic buyers actually bidding on, which honestly, a lot of publishers have never seen before. And they, they kind of find out, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm just passing an app store URL. That's all they're, they're, they get. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is what they get today. So then it's around, I think, you know, improving the integrations to get more signals. Um, and, and in some ways that can be enriched server side, you know, if you know what your app bundle is on, on a, on a Roku, you might be able to enrich that server side and so on. Um, but I think in a lot of ways it's about, yeah, just having transparency and understanding of what your inventory looks like to your buyers because that's the first step. If, if, it, if you're not passing the right signals, you can't hope you know, that, that money is going to come out of thin air. So it's, it's really what we focus on here at Publica and what I think helps publishers um, you know, create more, more opportunities. That's great. We have a, a question that I wanted to answer before we start to wrap up and, uh, from the audience. It says, could you speak about programmatic guarantees are buyers and publishers using them for CTV? Is there inventory that's not available except through programmatic guarantees? Anyone can answer. We at a &E, um, do not, we don't have inventory that's not available anywhere. So we, we approach the marketplace as having a flexible customer service centric kind of sales proposition. Um, and what I refer to a lot as our toolbox with a lot of different tools in it and direct sales and the way in which we sell sponsorship and, and go to market with direct sales, IO based strategy, uh, how programmatic is done. All of the inventory pulls the same. It's just the individual approaches that way we can solve for different agency advertisers, KPIs and objectives with programmatic guaranteed, um, over the last probably year, including the upfront last year, but more recently the upfront that we just finished 
uh, at the end of 2020, those negotiations, we saw a huge increase in the amount of programmatic guaranteed, uh, whether it be commitments or kind of endeavors, where a lot of agencies and holding companies were starting to approach their digital spend commitments as having flexibility to use programmatic capabilities. And what they wanted to do was leverage programmatic guaranteed. There's multiple reasons why. A, if an agency is committing dollars in an upfront, they've got to spend that money on behalf of their client. Otherwise, at the end of the year, their client is holding them liable for not spending all the marketing dollars. Um, agencies are paid a fee based on how much of the ad budget they actually spend. So again, it behooves them to spend this money. By, by leveraging programmatic in a non-guaranteed marketplace, um, there's no guarantee that your win rates are gonna be high enough to spend the money. You may find yourselves in a, a difficult place there. So programmatic guarantee has been a solution that really helped agencies, uh, especially as you look at the upfront. For publishers and programmers, we've embraced it uh, because it helps us with our bottom line forecasting and budgeting for the year. Um, plus it also, it allows us to bridge that gap between direct and, and programmatic, right? Um, and the ability to leverage the best of both worlds. You want the relationship, the agency, the advertiser want to know who it is that they're working with, what inventory they're buying and what they should expect out of it. So there's brand safety and all of those, you know, good key terms. And for us, we want to make sure that we're able to use automation, we're able to use data and technology that allows us to run the best yield management and yield optimization possible, um, ultimately resulting in the best efficiencies on both sides. So. Sorry, just to, to add a little bit to the programmatic guarantees. Um, I think there, there's a few um, very important, important factors to a PG deal. Uh, first is giving publishers the ability to know, do I have enough inventory to sell it, right? So forecasting is huge and forecasting in the programmatic ecosystem is actually pretty new for, for a, a lot, at least in the CTV side, few publishers know really how many avails they're gonna have, you know, in the next 15 days on a particular show. Um, so, so forecasting is huge then the ability to prioritize, right? So there's the concept of, you know, price-based competition, but there's in PG, there's also the concept of you're, you you have to give priority to, to a buyer that you, you've signed a deal with. So that's also important an important feature to, to be able to, to, to support. And then the other is holding the buyer accountable, right? To a, per, a certain participation rate. So you, once you have a PG deal, you expect the buyer to bid, you know, pretty consistently on, on whenever an, a, a piece of inventory becomes available. So that's also about, you know, being able to track participation rates, alert on drops so that the publisher can be aware of it. And the last thing I would say is, is uh, render rates. So, you know, something that comes up a lot in CTV, not talked about much, but the fact that you know there's very there are in, in many cases very low render rates. So when you win you know a programmatic auction, your ad might not make its way to the end user, either because in VOD there's prefetching or you know channel flipping or it's, it, technical errors is, is a big one too. Um, and and I think that's part of a PG deal is you know from a buyer's perspective, if I'm guaranteeing a deal, I also expect my bids to convert to impression. So you have to have as a publisher an understanding of. Um, what those render rates look like, what are the pockets of your inventory where those render rates are highest so that you can put those in the PG marketplace. So it's, uh, I think it's all about data and honestly quite a lot of work to, to Jason's point for, from, from the publishers. I mean, it's more about a, adapting, right? It's more buy side request, but very important to, to grow revenue into, especially in times where, you know, fill rates might be lower at certain times of the year. Definitely. Well, we're almost uh, out to the end of our hour. So I wanted to finalize this by kind of asking each of you um, your predictions for the CTV market uh, in the next three years. So let's start with sale and just like one or two sentences. What is What are your predictions over the next few years? I, I think it'll be much more simplified and unified from a commercial standpoint. I think the technology will advance overall user experience and the, um, you know, so for a lot of the targeting and reporting challenges that we face today, especially in the programmatic ecosystem. Um, so I'm optimistic. How about you, Henry? Uh, two things, regulation. And then also as well, I think the CPM model is gonna start to evolve as well. It won't just be based on sort of cost per thousands. It'll be based on cost per interaction, uh, X, Y, and Z. There will be some sort of evolution already starting to see it with some ad products out there, but yeah, the CPM model will begin to sort of, you know, evolve. I like, I like Henry's answer about uh, changing currencies. I think there's an opportunity in CTV to create new currency models, um, which will allow us to kind of diversify the revenue streams a little bit. 
and not be so reliant on uh, just viewership, but, but start to advance that conversation. Um, I think the, and I'm a, I'll be a little bullish on this, I think the viewership growth, um, we may actually see something similar to what we saw in 2020, where there could be an exponential kind of viewership growth and trajectory uh, in the next few years as smart TV manufacturers lean in further and further. You gotta keep in mind, a lot of these, the Vizios, the LGs, the Samsungs of the world, do not have the cable and broadcast companies apps built into them. They've just started these initiatives over the last you know, nine to 12 months, really in earnest. So as the, as the, the manufacturers start to build more and more programming apps into the TVs, um, I think that streaming and, and CTV viewership is going to continue to grow. And I think there's another point of uh, rapid growth uh, as we see more and more smart TV adoption and the use of the smart TV starting to change the trajectory as well. Um, only a few years ago, the percentage of smart TVs that were actually logged onto the internet and being used in that way uh, was sub 50%. Um, now you're, you're at a much higher uh, mark. Um, and I, I think the, as the apps become available, the adoption will grow. Uh, we, are a, we are a society that loves our convenience um, and the ability to have one-stop shopping on your TV and not the extra wires, the extra devices to switch through inputs, it sounds, Minimal, uh, but the reality is we don't want to lose that extra second or, or two. Um, so I think there's a I think there's a huge growth opportunity coming up from a viewership perspective. Once again, yeah, and to me that that growth opportunity is also international. We we haven't talked about it too much, but I think you know the the whole world is watching TV, and I just not necessarily connected TV yet. I think the U.S. is is really ahead in a lot of ways, and so it's. It's going to be really exciting to, to see, you know, CTV take over the world. Um, and and I, so that that's one. And then I think, you know, from a, to me that there's the other main factors are increased security, you know, which is going to make this, a, you know, the preferred medium of transaction once advertisers have trust in it. Uh, improvement in audience targeting and, and, and management. I think, you know, people-based TV marketing is certainly going to become a thing. And to me, that's what, you know, the, the, the opportunity we haven't talked about too much is, is capturing some of the dollars that are currently being spent on social um, in, in the CTV space. And I do think we're going to get there, especially as, as people-based uh, TV advertising becomes more and more a thing. And then content transparency. So, you know, giving the advertiser full details on what content they're buying, which, you know, which series, which episode, what's happening inside of that episode, letting them run their own, you know, ML models to understand what, what's, what's going on and, and bid accordingly. So I think th those things are, are going to ultimately uh, drive more and more ad dollars to the CTV ecosystem. Great. Well, thank you all for taking the time to talk with us today. And thanks everyone for watching. Um, uh, have a great one. Thanks so much.